The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates today. I think this is the the seventh rate hike. Six of those rate hikes have now taken place since Donald Trump was elected, five of them since he was inaugurated. The official rate now is 1.75 to 2 percent. Now, the Federal Reserve uh, targets uh, the midpoint of that range. But the Fed has been tightening a lot longer than those seven rate hikes. Because remember, before they hiked rates, they talked about it and they were tapering. And the tapering was a de facto tightening because interest rates were effectively negative while the Fed was doing the QE. And so as it was tapering those purchases, it was reducing the, the how much rates were actually negative. And that was, in fact, tightening. So the Fed has been tightening for a lot longer than the markets believe, which is why the recession is probably going to come a lot sooner and be a lot deeper than what anyone believes. In fact, if you listen to the press conference that followed the uh, announcement, which, you know, and in fact, now there were some rumors that came out earlier in the week that Powell thinks that the Fed should have a press conference following every single meeting. You know, right now they just do it quarterly. And when they initially announced that, uh, the reaction in the markets were, oh, maybe that means more rate hikes, right? Because every time the Fed hikes rates, they wait until they have a press conference. So the thinking was if they have more press conferences, they would have more rate hikes. But I don't think that means that at all. In fact, there is no rule that says the Fed needs a press conference to hike rates. They can hike rates at any meeting. In fact, they don't even need a meeting. They can hike rates between meetings. They just don't do it or they haven't been doing it, but there's nothing that says they can't. So I don't think having more press conferences means anything, uh, but people are always looking for an excuse to do something. And so that might have been an excuse at, uh, at that time. But if you listen to what Powell said at this press conference, he probably sounded as bullish on the U.S. economy. If you just listen to the words that he chose in describing it and everything, I don't think I've ever seen a, a, a Fed chairman as bullish on the economy. I mean, I can't remember. I mean, maybe I have, but it's been so long that I can't really remember. And given the fact that he is so bullish and given the fact that the Fed is a pretty good uh, contrarian indicator as far as being reliable, uh, if uh, Powell is extremely bullish, as bullish as a Fed chairman's ever been, it likely means that the best days of so-called growth are behind us and it is all downhill from here. In fact, he talks so bullishly about the economy, and he also, the Fed did indicate that there will likely be two more rate hikes uh, this year. You know, we've already had two, this being the second, and there'll be two more for sure. That will mean four on the year. And there, there was some uh, discussion as to whether or not we have three or four, and the fact that the Fed is now guiding us to four, they were saying, oh, this is a hawkish hike, right? And... I think, though, if you read between the lines, and it's not that hard to do, it's just that most people don't know how to read or can't even see the lines, but I think this was very dovish when it comes to the way the Fed talked about inflation. Once again, Powell said that their goal is symmetrical inflation. And you know, before I even get to symmetry, one of the funnier things was he was asked about inflation and whether or not if the Fed had achieved its goal and now it's happy that inflation's at 2%, and Powell basically said, it's a little early to declare victory. We want to just make sure that, you know, inflation stays at 2% and doesn't drift back down right before we take a bow and, and do a victory lap. As if victory over inflation is defined by lifting the inflation rate up to 2%. I mean, that's not a victory. Do you think consumers are going to celebrate that? Oh, they're going to cheer? Thank God, you know, hey, the Fed got inflation up to 2%. Great job. I was really worried that it was only going to be 1%. You know, forgetting about the fact that it's already much higher than that. I mean, nobody believes these government numbers except, I guess, the Wall Street investors, or maybe now Donald Trump believes the numbers, right? As far as Donald Trump's concerned, government numbers were written by God and they're now on tablets uh, given to him by, by Moses. But, you know, even if you accept those government numbers, it is not a victory making inflation higher. I mean, that is easy. I mean, central banks can always create more inflation. Just print money. 
Right? That's the fun part. Everybody loves you when you're printing money and causing stock market bubbles. Right? That, that's the easy part about being a central banker. That's not a victory. You know what victory is? Victory is when inflation is running out of control and now you have to bring it back down to 2%. See, that's a victory that Powell is never going to achieve. Not that he's not going to see inflation break it out. He's going to. Inflation is going to skyrocket and the Fed is not even going to try to bring it back down because they know it's impossible to do, at least not without destroying the entire house of cards economy that they've been so carefully erecting over the years. So there will be no real victory. I mean, Paul Volcker had a victory over inflation, right? He brought inflation down from double digits, right? And he had to do that by jacking interest rates up through the roof. But we know it's impossible to do that now. I mean, they've got interest rates up to 2%, but even that is going to have much worse uh, ramifications for this bubble economy than anybody believes. And of course, the Fed is still going to raise rates. In fact, one of the things that Powell said is that, well, you know, we're moving gradually. And he patted the Fed on the back for having moved gradually. He said, you know, there were some people that wanted us to move quicker. And I'm real glad that we didn't, right? Well, sure, maybe we'd already be in a recession had they moved quicker, but it would be uh, not as horrific as the, the even more horrific recession we're going to get because they moved so slowly. Uh, but Powell was saying that, well, you know, if we see evidence that the rate hikes are hurting the economy, well, we can always do something about it. Yeah, by the time they acknowledge that the rate hikes have hurt the economy or are hurting the economy, it'll all be in a recession. And then, of course, it's going to be too late to do anything about it, as if they could have done anything about it anyway. What are they going to do? They are going to reverse course. They're going to start cutting rates from wherever they, they got them, however high they made it. They're going to start slashing them pretty quick. But they're not going to have a lot of room to go between where they get to and zero. And so they're going to have to launch QE4. That is what's coming. you know. But when Powell talked about this symmetry, it was interesting because somebody asked him a question about you know the symmetry. Because they said, you know, well, you're saying that it was okay to have inflation you know, below 2%. Well, you know, how, you know, how long can it be above 2%? And he didn't answer that question. He kind of danced around it and said, well, we just don't like it if inflation persists above 2%, just like we didn't like it if it persisted below 2%. But he never defined how many months or years the CPI would have to be above 2% before the Fed was going to admit that it was persistent and now do something about it, because I don't think they ever want to put a, a number on it, because no matter how many months or years uh, inflation is above 2%, I don't think the Fed can do anything about it. And so they're not, but they have to pretend that they will. But this is an easing to me. It's very dovish. If the old policy was, we want to have 2% inflation, that was their old policy, which you know was not you know, really their mandate. The mandate is to have stable prices. That's their official mandate. If prices go up 2% every year, well, that's not stable prices. But initially, that 2% mandate was to keep inflation below 2%, right? So if it was at 1%, that was still within their mandate because one was lower than two. Then they moved the bar and they said, well, our goal is 2%, meaning if it's not 2%, if it's 1%, we have to actively work to raise the level to 2%. First of all, a, they can't even measure it that precisely anyway. So if they think it's 1%, it may it may be 2%. I mean, there's a pretty big margin of error, I guess, in these government numbers, especially the way they manipulate them. But the idea that 2% inflation is better than 1% is asinine. 1% is better than 2%. You know, if you're getting an A, then you don't need to try to get a C. Although 2% isn't an A. Maybe 0 is an A. 1% is a B, and maybe 2% is a C. So you don't work to reduce your grade, right? If you're doing well, you don't want to not do as well. But that was the policy to get to 2%. Now they've moved the bar again. Now they don't want to get to 2%. They want to get to symmetrical around 2%, meaning that we were below 2% for a while. Now we need to be above 2% for a while. So again, this is the Fed moving the bar to accept higher rates of inflation because they know they're powerless to do anything to bring it back down. And now the Fed is going to have ample cover to talk about or allow inflation to be above 2% because nobody really knows when it's persistent because there's no set definition of how long, how many you know months or years 
It's going to be there. In fact, I believe that once we really spike above 2% inflation, we may never be below it in my lifetime. I mean, the U.S. is headed for a high inflation, slow growth or no growth economy. That's where we're going. I mean, we have massive amounts of debt. What hope do we have of paying it off? None. So the only way to get out of it without admitting that we can't pay it and defaulting, which I, I, I put a very, very low probability of U.S. politicians ever doing anything honorable. So it's going to be inflation. I mean, that's the policy. This is going to be a high inflation economy, and we're never going to see rates as low as 2%, even officially. right? And so you know, to say that we're just going to be above it for a little while, just like we were below it for a little while, that, that's nonsense. But the question is, how long will it take for the markets to figure this out? In fact, we actually got economic data that came out earlier in the day, right? This is before uh, the Fed's announcement. We got producer prices, and the numbers were quite a bit higher than estimates. The consensus was for a 0.3% increase in May producer prices, and instead we rose by 0.5%, so not quite double uh, what they were looking for, but a big beat. But what really stands out is the year-over-year -year change. Right there, they were looking for 2.6% year-over-year increase. We got 3.1, a three-handle on PPI. This is the biggest jump in six years. And even the core was a little bit hotter than expected, up 0.3 instead of up 0.2. Year-over-year, core up 2.4. So even the core is you know well above the 2% level on the wholesale level. And, of course, rising wholesale prices – are going to bleed through into consumer prices. In fact, we got the consumer price index uh, came out yesterday. CPI was not quite as hot. That came in as expected, up 0.2, uh, and the year-over-year -year rise was 2.8. Still, I think that's about the biggest rise in six years as well, but probably the producer prices move first, and then the producers passed on the higher input costs to consumers. So probably the producer prices are a good leading indicator of what's in store for consumers. So we're looking at consumer prices. Pretty soon, they're going to be in a three-handle. And I don't know how you see three being symmetrical because we didn't spend a lot of time with inflation at 1%. You know, most of the time that inflation was below 2, it was still north of 1. So we start trading above 3, we left symmetry in the dust. But I wonder how long it's going to take people to figure that out. You know, the dollar still ended up a little lower on the day. And in fact, it tried to rally a bit, but by the close, it sold off. It wasn't a dramatic decline, but nonetheless, it went down a bit, even though the Fed's statement was perceived to be hawkish. Same thing for gold. I mean, gold rallied a bit, you know, about four bucks. You know, I think it's at $12.99 is where it closed. You know, gold's been trading. This month, I think gold has been at a $12 range from the highest price to the lowest price. I mean, it's barely moved. And to me, it's obviously consolidating, getting ready for a break in one direction or another. I mean, personally, I think it's more likely to be a break to the upside than a break to the downside. But it's going to break either way. I mean, it's not going to stay in this, you know, in this narrow range indefinitely. But I think the fact that, A, it didn't sell off today on what was considered a hawkish hike, and that the dollar didn't rally, that is good news, I think, uh, for gold, if you think gold's going to go up. Also, you know, the Dow Jones sold off at the end of the day, closed on the low of the day, down 119 points. Uh, all that really, the, all the losses probably in the last 15 minutes of trading. So the markets gave the hawkish hike a thumbs down. Uh, yields moved up, but they closed off their highs. We're still below 3% on the 10-year, but just barely. We're basically at 2.98. But the trend looks higher in yields. Look at commodity prices. Look at the, C, uh, the CRB index. That index looks like it's breaking out to me. Just take a look at a chart. Uh, and so those higher commodity prices are simply going to drive an already increasing uh, producer price index higher. So we got rising commodity prices. You know, Donald Trump came out today and again, you know, pounded his fist that oil prices are too high, trying to jawbone them down. I think maybe Trump realizes that oil prices going up, among other things, is going to be a problem for the economy. And he's hoping to talk oil prices down by calling out the Saudis. But I don't think it's going to work. Kind of like King Canuck, you know, trying to stop the tide. It's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how much he complains 
about prices going up, prices are going to keep going up. And one of the reasons that prices are going up is because of his tax cuts, right? Why are the tax cuts the reason that prices are going up? Because of the way they're being financed. They're financed with bigger budget deficits. And what do bigger budget deficits mean? Bigger budget deficits mean we have to print more money. We have to create more inflation. And that means prices are going to go up. You know, I want to backtrack again and talk about this inflation. And again, the the markets still do not understand how this is going to play out, right? They still think that these higher inflation numbers are good news, right? Because the Fed talks about it again. Victory, right? We've, we're, you know, higher inflation is victory. People associate inflation with a good economy. And they think that you know, prices going up is a reflection of a stronger economy. So that's why they're excited about it. And, of course, they also don't perceive that it's going to run out of hand for you know, who knows why. I mean, because it can't be the Fed that's going to contain it because the Fed is basically out of the game because it, it can't raise rates high enough to ever fight inflation given the amount of debt that it allowed the economy to take on as it was you know, gradually raising rates and as they kept them at zero for near eight years. I mean, Powell is so proud of what the Fed did, right? Remember how, how, how proud Alan Greenspan was too. You know, but, you know, then we got the, the, the financial crisis, which the result of his, you know, monetary hocus pocus. And, you know, Greenspan, by the way, was on CNBC today. You know, he's much better now than he was when he was Fed chairman. And what is he saying? He's saying stagflation. He's saying slow growth. The deficits are, are, are a drain. Uh, he's saying uh, inflation's coming back. You know, stagflation. He's saying the same stuff as me, except he's sugarcoating it a bit. I believe that Greenspan privately is is pretty much probably in my camp. He just doesn't want to come out and say it, A, because, you know, when you're when you live in a glass house, you're not supposed to throw stones, right? So he doesn't want to accept his own responsibility. And he also claims that he doesn't want to be critical of other Fed chairmen uh, because uh, Paul Volcker wasn't critical of him. And so that's why he's staying quiet. And it's a convenient excuse because he knows that what these Fed chairmen have been doing leads to disaster because he wrote the playbook that they're following and he's the one that knows how the play ends. The problem is these fools that have followed him have no idea, right? They actually think this stuff is going to work. Greenspan knows it's not going to work. I'll give him at least that much credit. He knows that he was full of it, and but Powell has no idea. Powell doesn't understand as much about economics as Greenspan, doesn't understand as much about money, and so he's clueless. And he, he may actually believe all this nonsense he said today, and he is in for a rude awakening. But what the markets don't understand on inflation is these rising inflation numbers do not evidence a good economy. They just evidence the fact that there's a lot of inflation in the pipeline. The inflation was the creation of money. And now that inflation is showing up in rising consumer prices. For a while, nobody cared about it because it showed up in rising stock prices, rising bond prices rising real estate prices. So everybody loves the inflation when it makes them richer. But when they hate the inflation is when it makes them poorer because now they have to buy more expensive stuff. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who don't own stocks, who don't own real estate. And so they never got richer. They only got poorer. And they're the ones that voted for Donald Trump and put him into office. But a lot of people who think they're rich because they have big stock portfolios and bond portfolios have no idea how poor they're going to get uh, when the inflation genie finally you know, comes out of its bottle and there's no way to contain it. So these rising inflation numbers that everybody is dismissing are a big problem. And the initial reaction to the increase in inflation is, oh, this is good for the dollar because it just ensures that the Fed is going to hike rates more because it's got to keep a lid on inflation. No, it's not. It doesn't ensure that at all. The Fed is hiking rates. It doesn't even care what the inflation rate is because even if it's spiked up, it's not going to be more aggressive because it knows that the economy can't stand it. So what's going to happen is initially inflation is going to pick up. But then the economy is going to slow down. Why? Well, rising prices will slow the economy because it, 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 it eats into consumption. But it's also going to push up interest rates, which will slow the economy because of all the debt. And so as inflation pushes up consumer prices and interest rates, it puts downward pressure on the economy and also downward pressure on uh, other financial assets like real estate, which is a function of mortgage debt, stocks, which are a function of interest rates. As stocks, as interest rates go up, 
the present value of stocks goes down. I mean, that's just math, right? You can't get around that. Plus, rising interest rates are also going to hurt corporate profits. So, you know, the tax cuts are one positive, but you got all these negatives that everybody is overlooking because all they can see is, is the tax cuts. So then you get the economy weakening, but inflation is still getting worse. And that worsening inflation, which is, again, was created years and years ago, right? It's not new policy that's creating the inflation. The inflation is here from stuff that happened on Bernanke's watch. <laughs> so it, which is just catching up to us, and it's going to get a lot worse. But as the economy is weakening, then inflation is picking up. Now what? Before you know it, we're in recession, but we have higher inflation. We're in stagflation. And now what is the Fed going to do? Is the Fed going to start fighting inflation? Not a chance. They're going to start fighting recession the only way they know how. They're going to slash rates and do QE4. And the dollar is going to implode. Right? Gold's going to go through the roof. Now, obviously, between now and then, there's going to be a move. The market is going to start to anticipate this stuff long before the Fed has to admit it. The $64 trillion question is when? I don't know, but I want to be prepared for it, right? I'm all in on this trade personally. And, you know, again, it's been frustrating these last couple of weeks. We've had another big pickup in uh, clients, uh, you know, folding and, and closing out their accounts and, and moving on or telling us, you know, just get me into the U.S. market. I mean, sometimes people don't close their accounts. They just say, look, I want to get out of these foreign stocks and these funds. Just let me, I want to get into the U.S. market, right? So, but either way, they're folding on my strategy and they're adopting a more mainstream strategy. And, you know, this just, you know, excites me. I mean, I'm upset for my clients that are making fatal financial decisions, but it's a great contrarian indicator. I've said this, whenever... Our strategy pulls back, which means there's a rise in the dollar. And we've had that. And recently, we've had a pullback in uh, uh, some of the emerging market stocks because of the strong dollar. I've talked about that. Whenever we get a pullback in our accounts because there's a rise in the dollar, at the end of that is when all the clients, you know, we get the clients calling up, hey, I want out. Cash me out. Sell me out. And every time that happens, it's right before the next big move up in, in our strategy. And then that quiets everybody down. Oh, OK, everything is all right. And then if there's a pullback... They get out because they're still looking at the longer term and looking at where they were maybe five years ago and not looking at the progress in the last two years. But when it goes down, they start to get nervous and it's happened again. But all this stuff is exactly what I expected to happen. The, the time scale is not exactly right. Obviously, all this stuff is happening on a much longer time scale than I first imagined. But the fact is, it's all happening. And all of it makes sense to me. And I can see all these clueless people that never understood anything about the economy, about the Fed, that were completely blindsided by the 2008 financial crisis, right? They're, 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 they are, they're just as drunk now, right? It's the same story, right? The greatest story never told. This is what Larry Kudlow said when Bush was president. Goldilocks, right? Greatest story never told. I mean, it's, you know, this is the greatest economy ever. Just like, you know, Trump, again, you know, Trump tweeted a response to Robert De Niro. And, you know, and, you know, of course, Robert De Niro was way out of line. I already mentioned that on the last podcast. Although I guess basically the most literate criticism he could come up with uh, was F Trump. I mean, that's that's it. That's the height of, of his intelligence. And to show how unintelligent the audience was over at the Tonys, they all stand up and applaud because like this is the greatest thing they've ever heard. Like, you know, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you said it, right? F, F Trump. So Trump, you know, uh, criticizes uh, uh, De Niro. He says he's punch drunk or punchy or whatever. But then he says, doesn't De Niro realize that we have the greatest economy in history right now? The greatest economy in history? I mean, come on. I mean, it's not even close. The greatest economy in history was over 100 years ago. The greatest economy was like, during uh, the Industrial Revolution, in the period you know after the Civil War, maybe 1880 through through 1910 or somewhere in there, right? You know, when we, the the purest period of the gold standard, right? That is when we had the greatest economic growth. And economic growth is measured by the increase in the standard of living of your people, not these ridiculous government statistics. But that's when living standards rose the most, and they rose the quickest. We're not even close to that. Right now, for Trump to come out there and say, this is the greatest economy in the history of the country, when two years ago as a candidate, it was the worst economy in the history of the country. I mean, he was a lot closer to being true then 
than, than he is now. I mean, we're, the economy is barely different, with the exception of there's more uh, misplaced optimism. Uh, but all that is about to come crashing down. The Fed doesn't see it. The administration doesn't see it. People are going to get blindsided by this. Unfortunately, I've said this over and over again, the politics are awful because it means that it's going to get blamed on the tax cuts. It's going to get blamed on the deregulation. And Donald Trump, and I've made this analogy before, but I'll make it again. Donald Trump is our Jimmy Carter, right? Except the, the, uh, the parties are reversed, right? Jimmy Carter came in when the economy was a wreck because the Republicans wrecked it, right? Richard Nixon, right? Ford. And remember, Richard Nixon imposed wage and price controls when inflation was 4%. We're at 3.1 year-over-year -year inflation on the PPI. We're, we're gonna be, we could be at 4% within a year. That's the level that you know Nixon put on wage and price controls. And of course, we had a much more honest, much more honest CPI back then than the rigged one we got now. But when Jimmy Carter came in, it was because the economy was a mess. And so he was uh, a, an outsider. You know, he was a peanut farmer. I mean, he had been governor for Georgia, I think, maybe one term. But he didn't run as a governor. He ran as a peanut farmer. I'm going to clean up Washington, right? I'm going to drain the swamp, right? Although he didn't use those exact words. But that was the idea. Let's get somebody, an outsider, into Washington because the political insiders uh, made a big mess, right? And the fact that Nixon had to resign with the Watergate scandal, uh, you know, you know, made it even easier. But the bottom line was it was the economy, stupid, that got Jimmy Carter into office. And it was the economy that sent them packing after one term because all the problems got worse on his watch. Right? And he didn't do anything differently. And then we went hard right. We went from the Rockefeller Republicans, not not uh, Barry Goldwater, right? The, the Republicans didn't want you know, Barry Goldwater went down in flames, even though he won the nomination. He went down in flames uh, to Lyndon Johnson. And so the Republicans went left and they elected a, a tricky dick. But after eight years of Rockefeller Republicans, the economy was a mess. And then we get a Democrat in there and it gets and, it, it, you know, the mess explodes. And, and again, it didn't even start under Nixon. It started under Lyndon Johnson, the Great Society, War on Poverty, Mission to the Moon, Guns and Butter, right? But then Nixon continued all that. And so, but Carter got the blame. And then we went hard right. We said, you know what? A pox on everybody. And Reagan came in and said, the Democrats are the problem. The Republicans are the problem because the Republicans were too liberal. They weren't Goldwater Republicans like I am. They were Rockefeller Republicans. And the country said, you know what? It's such a disaster. Let's give that a try. Let's give capitalism. Let's give small government. Reagan was campaigning on cutting government, making government smaller, liberating the private sector, shrinking the budget deficits. You know, that was part of his campaign, even though they ran up. He wanted to balance the budget, get rid of the Department of Energy, the Department of Education, all this stuff, right? Remember, I mean, Jimmy Carter had just started the Department of Energy, so so it was you know a lot easier to get rid of it because they just started it. But the country accepted Reagan because Carter took the fall for all the problems that he inherited. Well, the same thing is going to happen to Trump, only opposite parties. Trump inherited these huge problems that were started under a liberal Republican, Bush, made worse under a Democrat, Obama. Now he comes in, everybody thinks he's this free market Republican. He's not. right? He's a, as big a spender as anybody, even bigger all of these chickens come home to roost while he's in the office claiming everything is fantastic. And now we do a Ronald Reagan in reverse. Now we go hard left. Now we don't just go to a moderate, quote unquote, uh, liberal or normal liberal. We go full socialism. We go Bernie Sanders. We go all in on government. And if it's not Sanders, it's somebody that's just like him. And the same thing is going to happen in Congress. I'm going to wrap up this podcast again talking about cryptocurrencies. The crypto bloodbath continues. As I am speaking, uh, Bitcoin is trading, and I'm looking at one particular exchange on Bitstamp. And Bitcoins are trading below 6,300. The low on Bitstamp earlier today was 6,120. So it's a hair above, I think, the intraday low from. Uh, April. I did. I did think we traded just below six thousand 
briefly before a huge rally. I'm not really sure how far below, maybe not even one or two dollars below, but I, I think we did dip our toe below before we had a big rally back above 10,000 that ultimately failed. And now we're back down at that double bottom, which I mentioned on my last podcast, I thought was going to be broken. And it appears that it will be. The market continues to melt down. Again, not just Bitcoin. In fact, Bitcoin is actually losing value more slowly uh, than all the altcoins because Bitcoin's market dominance now is back above 40 percent. And, you know, that's the first time it's been above 40 in, in, in some time. So all the cryptocurrencies are going down. The combined market capitalization of all the cryptos is now bound below 270 billion, which is still a very big number. It's just nowhere near that 800 billion or wherever it was above that at the height of the mania uh, back in December of last year. Uh, but there's still a lot of market cap that's going to be lost, uh, I believe, in the months, years ahead. And to me, again, this is still a very orderly decline. The volumes are not blowing out. Nobody is panicking. You know, I go on uh, I, some of these websites on the Internet and YouTube and, you know, look at all these uh, crypto guys. And some of them do believe that there's some more downside to go, but they're still bullish. They buy the dip, 25000 by year end, 50000 by year end. I mean, all in, keep holding. Nobody is saying time to get out. Nobody. There isn't a single video of any Bitcoin guy that's been in for years saying the top is in, time to time to get out, right? No, nobody is thrown in the towel. They're all talking about a correction in an ongoing bull market, even though we've been in a bear market. I mean, we you know, we're down like 70% since the peak in December. And it sure looks like a bear market to me, except the people who are in it are in denial about it, especially these hardcore guys who started early, who still don't realize that Bitcoin today is nothing like Bitcoin was when it first got started. Remember, the appeal of Bitcoin was that it was easy to use it for transactions. They were low cost and they were anonymous. The governments didn't know what you were doing and the government was cracking down on, on wires. It was hard to send it in international wires. It was expensive. There was all these KYC, know your customer, anti-money laundering. And so the use case for Bitcoin is that it operated kind of in secret, in the shadows. And, you know, it, you know, it was it was great to have some privacy. That's what the, you know, part of the free market libertarian appeal. It's not government. It's private. Government isn't regulating it. They're not interfering in it. That's completely different now. Now it's all about government regulation. These idiots actually think that regulation is good for the market. You hear these nuts on CNBC. We welcome the regulation in Bitcoin. I mean, it's, it's the kiss of death. It's like, you know, you know, Superman saying he, he, he welcomes kryptonite. No, I mean, and it's not like these Bitcoins are Superman because the problem with Bitcoin from the beginning, even though you have that utility of that, you know, it was anonymous and you could you can transact in it. The problem was it had no store of value. You, you didn't know you, there was no way to reliably hold on to it. That was the problem. Only not only because it had no intrinsic value, but because there was an unlimited number of other cryptocurrencies that could be created. Uh, but none of the, and now, you know, it should be obvious. You know, I was watching and then an interview with the, the, the Winklevi again, talking about Bitcoin. Again, these guys are so clueless. I know they were the first Bitcoin billionaires. And the reason they got to be billionaires is because they were clueless enough to buy them in the first place. I mean, it's like it's sometimes you don't have to be smart to get rich, right? You could be dumb and then get lucky, right? Because I don't know that these guys, although it's possible that they weren't dumb. Maybe what they're saying is a bunch of BS. And they, they could know it's BS. They could be, you know, you know, sly like a fox. They might have said, you know what? This is all a bunch of crap, but this could be a huge bubble and we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to get in early and we're going to help sucker everybody in and then we're going to bail out. And if that's the case, then they have to publicly keep spewing this nonsense. So I'm not going to criticize them because I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they, they're just, this is just part of their plan to, you know, to, to hype up, uh, you know, to pump it up so they can dump it. But all their arguments were about how Bitcoin was going to disrupt gold because it was better than gold. Like it, it can do everything gold can do, only better. It can't do anything gold can do. <laughs> I mean, it has the properties that made gold better as money than other commodities, but it fails at the most basic requirement that it be a commodity, that it have value in the first place. You can't do anything with Bitcoin. You can do all sorts of things with gold. And that's the thing that uh, uh, the, the, the Winklevi, at least publicly, are completely clueless about. But what's driving this sell-off today, 
Or at least this is the excuse, because I think if people were really worried about this, we would be a lot lower uh, you know, than, than 6,000, and maybe we're going to go uh, to the extent that these rumors are true. And I've talked about these in the past. This is not the first time I've talked about this, but there was a paper that came out today, uh, I think from a couple of college professors, um, on Bitcoin being manipulated. Now, of course, you know, who would, you know, this is, you know, like, oh, I'm surprised, right, that there's gambling going on here, right? I mean, I mean, the fact that Bitcoin may be manipulated should not come as a shock to anybody. But here they, they lay out the case uh, pretty convincingly that you have, you know, some unknown whales, right, big holders, big wallets loaded up with uh, Bitcoins that they bought real cheap early on, and that these whales are manipulating the price. Uh, and, and the way they do it is they utilize Tether. And I talked about this before when the allegations arose months ago. And I said if these were true, this is huge. And, you know, we still don't know if they're true, but, you know, maybe we're getting closer. You know, where there's smoke, there's fire. So if you don't remember, uh, we'll, we'll go over uh, this, uh, this scam and the way it works. So Tether is the cryptocurrency that is backed one by one by dollars. And there's about, supposedly, there's two and a half billion tethers, and there's two and a half billion dollars in a bank account, in theory. And, you know, the bank account is in Puerto Rico, because they, they were dealing with Wells Fargo initially, and Wells Far Fargo fired them as a client, because it's very risky to deal in, in this, because of, you know, risks for money laundering. So they had to find a bank, and they found one in Puerto Rico. And so supposedly that's where that's where the money is. But they also work, the same guys that started Tether, own Tether, own this exchange, Bitfinex. And I think that's based out of the BVI. Um, but the uh, Bit Bitfinex has been utilizing Tether, according to these allegations, or the uh, large whales have been utilizing this connection to manipulate the price of Bitcoins. How do they do that? Well, when the Bitcoin market is tanking, right, they come in to stop the decline and they buy Bitcoins, but they buy them with counterfeit tethers. See, tethers are supposed to only come into existence when they get dollars sent in. So somebody sends in $100 and they create 100 tethers. It's a one-for-one, -one, fully reserved uh, you know, cryptocurrency where it's fully redeemable and fully backed 100%, right, not fractional reserve banking, 100% by dollars, right? And the allegations that, you know, we had, and the government's now looking into this, right, in manipulation is, is it true? Do they really have the backing? And this is what the allegations are, that when the cryptocurrencies are falling in a big way, they create tethers out of thin air without any dollars behind them. They just manufacture them, like the Federal Reserve, right, just creates money. And then they go into the market and they buy Bitcoin to stop the fall and start a big rise to make everybody think, aha, here's the support, here's the buying, right? It's like almost like they're acting as a central bank defending the currency, right? You think, oh, this is all independent. This is all, no, it's not. They're manipulating it. They're basically counterfeiting tethers, uh, expanding the money supply that is able to bid up uh, crypto prices. And then once they get Bitcoin going up, well, then all the cryptocurrencies go up. Right. Then what do they do once they've created a rally, a strong enough rally that now feeds on itself because now more speculative money comes in, then they start unloading the cryptocurrency they bought so they can get dollars to replace what they need in their bank account so they can keep these tethers back. So for a while, they expand the number of tethers in circulation beyond the reserves. But then when crypto, when Bitcoin rises, they can sell those coins at a profit, right? And now they can get back the dollars they need to, to back up their, um, their, their tethers. But here's the problem with that. I mean, of course, there's a million problems because it's manipulation. It's probably illegal. They're violating all sorts of laws. But no one even knows what's going on. That's part of this new investigation that the government is doing, and they're you know subpoenaing all these records. But the problem would happen is, what happens if they try to stop Bitcoin from falling, and they buy a bunch of Bitcoin, and then it doesn't rally? What if it keeps falling? What if some other whales decide, I'm unloading, and the price keeps falling? Well, then they never get to sell at a profit, and so they never get to replace the dollars they lost 
which means the tethers are not backed by dollars, which means if people want their money back, they can't get it because it's not there. Right now, your bank has failed and you have no you know, FDIC. Now, what I don't understand is with all these allegations out there that tethers are not backed, why does anybody still have their tethers? Why isn't there a run on tethers right now? I mean, maybe a run's going to start. Now, if they have all the dollars there, then no problem, right? They can redeem all the tethers. But if they don't, if they're short right now, if they've already been intervening into the markets, if they've been creating tethers and expanding the tether supply recently in this decline, and now a bunch of people that own tethers want their money back and it's not there, what are they going to do? Like the, the article that I read today, the paper, which I put on my Facebook page, said that maybe they were going to pretend they got hacked or something. And, oh, you know, it was a hack and our dollars were stolen or something like that. I mean, they, wouldn't, they didn't want to admit that they were using uh, the, the, the tethers to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. But, of course, if they were doing it in the past, if that's how they stopped the, the hemorrhaging before, maybe they're not going to do it this time now that they're under a microscope. Right now that everybody is looking and investigating them for manipulation, maybe that, 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 uh, that, that's gone. That put protection is gone. We'll find out. Right? We haven't had a violent fall, but we haven't had any real rallies either. I mean, if you're watching the way we've moved down from 8,000 to 6,000, there really hasn't been any significant rallies along the way. Maybe a couple hundred bucks, but we've just been melting down. Uh, with no big manipulation. So maybe the manipulators are afraid uh, and they're backing off. But this is a big story. I mean, if this is real, right? And I said this when I first talked about it. If these allegations are real and they were counterfeiting tethers and deliberately manipulating the price, this is the biggest negative for crypto since Mt. Gox. It's probably bigger than Mt. Gox. It could be the nail in the crypto coffin. Because the other problem that the cryptos are having right now is that the price has collapsed to the point where it's no longer profitable to mine them. You know, I think it costs like three or four thousand dollars to mine a Bitcoin right now. And that's on the low end. I mean there are some countries where it costs a lot more than that. But that's assuming you have the machines. Right? Once you have the machines, that's what it costs. But you gotta buy the computers. And they don't last forever. They, they wear out. you got to replace them. So I think all in, when you factor in the cost, the depreciation of the equipment, I think maybe it's five or $6,000 is what it costs to make a Bitcoin. Well, I mean, you're, there's not much profit in it right now. What if the price drops to $5,000, $4,000? Hey, turn the machines off, right? Now all the miners have to stop mining. And, and so this is going to help implode the whole, the whole thing. Now, from what I understand about Bitcoin... As fewer people are mining, right, it, it automatically becomes easier to mine and therefore less expensive. So at some point, if enough miners leave the industry because of the there's no profits, uh, then the uh, it will get easier for those that remain. So it won't require as much money to mine one, uh, mine in quotes, and, and then at some point it might be profitable. But if the price keeps falling, I don't know how quickly it reacts. And of course, you need the miners to validate all these transactions. And if all these miners are leaving the industry because they can't make any money, it's going to slow up the whole process and make it even harder to transact and blow up the whole supposed use case for Bitcoin. You know, and I hear all the time, too, when people are defending Bitcoin. And I, I'm doing this, this Bitcoin debate uh, in New York City, uh, I think July, July 1st. So it'll be really interesting to see how this debate goes. I know it's it's been sold out. And then I'm doing another Bitcoin debate in Freedom Fest. I mentioned that. That's going to be in mid-July in, uh, in Las Vegas. But one of the things they say is the reason that Bitcoin is here to stay and is going to keep going up is because there's so much infrastructure now. Like so much money has been invested. You know, Wall Street has funded all these companies that are built around the blockchain. And so because we have this critical mass of infrastructure, we have all these people, well now, you know, that guarantees that the longevity of Bitcoin, that, you know, it's some kind of network effect and it's going to keep on getting bigger. This is all a bunch of nonsense. All of that investment is what Mises used to call malinvestment. The only reason that so much capital went into all these nonsense crypto companies is because everybody was under the delusion that crypto prices were going to keep on rising. And everybody wanted to get in on it, right? just like the dot-com bubble, just like any bubble. But none of these companies are going to survive. They're all going to go bankrupt. Once crypto prices crash, right, and it's no longer going up, and it's no longer get rich quick, and you know what color do you want your, your Lambo to be, 
right? I mean, when it's not just all Lamborghinis, when people are losing their money, when people borrow money on their credit cards and they can't pay their loans, when people blew their retirement. Remember, I mentioned on the show, I had clients, clients wanting to cash out their accounts, and some did their IRAs and go all in on cryptocurrencies, on Bitcoin, when it was between 15000 and 20000 I didn't have any clients call me at all to put their accounts into Bitcoins until the top. As I said, my clients are a great contrarian indicator, at least some of them, right? But um, so when this thing falls apart and all these people realize they made a mistake, right? a lot of these you know, uh, MBAs that left uh, Wall Street firms to join these crypto companies, they're all going to go, they're going to leave. You know, I guess this is going to be a big disaster for all the condos in Puerto Rico because a lot of these guys came in, you know, because they were expecting huge profits in 2018 because they made so much money in 2017. Then they all started moving to Puerto Rico. This is where all the losses are going to be. You know, there's one problem about being in Puerto Rico. You don't get capital gains, but you also don't get losses, right? Because, you know, there's, you're, the losses don't do you any good when you're in Puerto Rico because, you know, you, you, the losses don't help if you don't have any, if, you, if you're not paying taxes on your gains. But a lot of these people were buying condos and doing stuff in Condado. Uh, this whole thing is going to blow apart. This whole Portopia dream, soul, whatever they're calling it, is going to come crashing down. But to say that because we have all this malinvestment, that that somehow justifies it. No, as soon as the currency collapses and there's no more interest, because if you actually listen to the stories, actually listen to what somebody is saying about how this is going to change the world and all the things that crypto is going to do, if you just listen to it, it's pure unadulterated BS. It always has been and it always was. It's just that when the price was going up, nobody cared, right? There's nothing that will make you lose your mental capacities like the prospect of getting rich, right? Getting something for nothing. Everybody, all of a sudden, everybody's going to be a millionaire and a billionaire. And so everybody wants it to work. And so it's a case of cognitive dissonance. You refuse to listen to any information that would suggest that you're wrong. Because it's so contradictory to what you want to believe that you refuse to acknowledge it until after the fact when you can look back. That's how everybody was on Wall Street. Nobody could see the financial crisis coming until after the fact. And then they said, well, of course, yes, but nobody saw it coming when, of course, people did. There are always people that see it coming, whether it's the crypto bubble. And again, I'm not saying I told you so on crypto yet. I know it's still 6000 and gold is only 1300 I know, I know. So I'm not going to you know, take the victory lap until... Crypto is, you know, well below the price of gold, and but that's coming, you know, and 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 when it's coming, I'm I'm sure I will take credit for it. But for now, yes, I recognize it that it's still higher than it was when I first called it a bubble, and that is always the case with bubbles. You never know how big they're going to get before they pop. But if you understand and you're thinking rationally, you're not surprised when bubbles pop. What surprises you is that they take so long to pop. And that is what's going on right now in the broader economy. It's all cryptocurrency. It's all Bitcoin. Everybody is under a delusion about the U.S. economy, the strength of the economy, the ability of the Fed to raise rates, the trajectory of raising rates, the fact that we're, you know, we're never going to have another recession. All this stuff, everybody believes it. It's complete nonsense. And they're all going to find out the hard way. But when they find out the hard way, right, that's when investors who have been following my strategy – are going to uh, benefit. And maybe there's some signs that stuff is starting to move up. I mean, you know, we had uh, Endeavor Silver uh, up 8% today. I think it was up maybe 5 or 6% yesterday as well. Big move, new 52-week high, no news. Why is that happening? I mean, I don't know. I mean, Silver was up above $17 today, up about $0.22. Cents. So a nice move. But that's a big move in two days. All the move ahead of the rate hike. In fact, Endeavor Silver was up 10% early this morning on the day before the Fed hike. So I don't know. There's no news. Maybe something's going on. Maybe there's some money moving in uh, to the mining sector. And, you know, for some reason, money jumped into that stock. You know, actually, as I'm recording this podcast, I'm just looking at my emails. And I got one from Endeavor that they announced after the close that they were going to be doing an offering of stock. They're going to be selling stock into the market they're going to raise as much as 35.7 million US dollars in the offering uh, using the proceeds for general corporate purposes but also to build out or develop a mine now they're not required 
to sell. They're allowed to sell. They don't have to sell any. But uh, obviously, this announcement is probably going to put a short-term kibosh on the uh, the big rally that I just mentioned that we had over the past uh, couple of days. You know, this has been one of the problems in the mining sector. They have to raise capital to continue to develop their mines, and so they have to keep selling stocks. So the supply of stock keeps growing. And, of course, there hasn't been a lot of demand because the sector has been so out of favor, and so this has helped depress a very depressed market. Although when the market turns, when the sentiment turns, when gold finally breaks out, when people realize – that rising interest rates are not bearers for gold when they realize that rising inflation are not bearers for gold when, in fact, it's extremely bullish for gold. When they figure it out, uh, then these companies will no longer have a problem. They may need to raise cash, but they'll have an easy time of doing it because investors will be throwing cash at them at much higher prices. Uh, but I would rather be buy now uh, when nobody is interested in the sector than in the future when it's a feeding frenzy. I'm not recommending the stock. I don't give stock recommendations on this show. You know, full disclosure, I have a huge personal position in Endeavor Silver. I've held the stock for a long time. But again, I'm not recommending anybody buy it. I'm just pointing out that it went up and maybe it's it, it, it's a sign of something. But if you do want an actual recommendation of stocks to buy, my brokers are happy to relate my recommendations to you. Just give them a call. Talk to one of my brokers at Europe Pacific Capital. You know, this is a great time to be positioning in our strategy. I, I, we've been waiting a while for the payoff. I know our accounts bottomed in January of 2016. And so we've been moving up since then, but not in a straight line because year to date we're negative. But I think that we're just setting up for a huge move when the dollar rolls over and people figure out what I've known for years and I've been positioning both myself and my clients uh, to take advantage of.